Welcome back to People's University Ancient History, the grand finale. Thanks for coming. Appreciate y'all turning out. Appreciate uh, Dr. Diener making it back. And uh, next week, I forgot my sheet, so I'm just going to wing this because uh, I'm not running back in there. Uh, St. Patrick's Day celebration with Fair May. Uh, and if you haven't heard them, they're excellent. And they're, like I said, they're getting a lot of gigs these days because they're very good. And, but they're going to do some rebel songs here and, and Santina. Thanks, Julia. Look at that. Uh, and then on the 21st at noon, these are lunch with books programs. Colonel Ruby Bradley. This is the West Virginia Humanities. Don't do that. Okay. I'm here by myself tonight. Okay. Uh, West Virginia Humanities Council History Alive program. So she portrayed, she is portrayed by Becky Park. She's the most decorated female in the U.S. Army in 1963 when she retired. Uh, so very interesting story from West Virginia. Okay. And as you can see, this is a picture of me from St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> uh, this is a you were grim. You were getting a butt bath? <laughs> Uh, among other things. Uh, Dr. Laura Michelle Diener is back, and uh, she's taught ancient and medieval history at Marshall since 2008. She's won several awards for teaching, received her PhD from The Ohio State University, and has studied at Vassar College, Newnham College, Cambridge, and most recently, Vermont College of Fine Arts. Please welcome her back, Dr. Diener. everyone. Um, I missed you all. I'm sorry I wasn't here for a few weeks, um, but I'm, I'm very happy to be back. And um, I, we're just going to get right into it because this is one of my favorite subjects. And I know that it's fascinating uh, to m most people, really. Uh, when I teach, I get uh, probably the most questions about Pompeii of anything. And uh, it's a place where, unlike Egypt, I have uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, traveling to several times. So I have some I have some personal pictures to share as well. Uh, before I get started, is there any sort of burning question that anybody has about Pompeii? If so, I want to make sure I answer it. <laughs> yeah, get it, get it. <laughs> Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, there's about a quarter of the city that still hasn't been excavated. Uh, but a lot of what they're working on, too, is going, going deeper. There's you know, the layer of the city that was destroyed uh, in 79 AD, but then there's um, archaeological expeditions that are trying to kind of go under that. Uh, there's been evidence of habitation um, and some kind of like town life since about the sixth century BC. So some of those earlier layers are still under excavation. Um, which actually that kind of leads to, I think one of the most interesting parts about Pompeii. Uh, the reason it's so famous is because of just those few days in 79 AD under the Roman Empire when Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed uh, not just the city of Pompeii, but neighboring towns, uh, Stabiae, Herculaneum, and then also, um, you know, uh, its effects were felt all over the Bay of Naples. But even though that is the moment that made Pompeii famous for us, it was, of course, a living city. It had a history long before that particular volcanic eruption, and it continued to have a history long after. So it really, we tend to speak of it very dramatically as being frozen in time, but of course it wasn't frozen in time. Um, it's continued to have um, a living history. Uh, people continue to return to the site. Uh, the effects of, um, of tourism and archeology span have continued to transform uh, the site. And in fact, uh, so, has, so has nature. Uh, that was not the only volcanic eruption. It had erupted 
before, and it continued to erupt most recently in 1944. Uh, so, and the seismic activity is uh, continually monitored, uh, because, and there's in fact an evacuation plan for that area should it erupt again, which apparently is not nearly efficient enough, and it's it's not going to work. But uh, you know, <laughs> they'll, they'll see what happens. Um, and also, it's felt the effects of uh, external events as well, not just in Rome, but uh, continuing into the modern period. Some of the buildings were destroyed in 79, rebuilt, you know, reconstructed, uh, beginning in the 18th uh, century when you know, archeology span as a field really got underway, as did tourism. And then those reconstructions were destroyed again in 1943 <coughs> during Allied bombings. Uh, so some of the exact same buildings were then, were then re-destroyed. So it's had, um, you know, a rich and long history extending, let's see, before and after uh, 79. Now, uh, I always thought before I kind of looked into this that Pompeii was also this like a second of everyday life frozen in time. Let's see, that we could uh, see Pompeii and basically see, you know, everyday life in a Roman city. Um, you know, we can more than other places, but at the same time, uh, the inhabitants of Pompeii were not caught unawares by this eruption at all. So we're not really seeing a frozen moment of everyday life. We're actually seeing uh, a moment of the city in crisis. Um, so, for example, uh, we'll find bodies that are buried in basements where people sought refuge. Um, many people, probably the majority of the inhabitants, had already fled the city because the volcano doesn't just erupt immediately, you know, with no warning. There's warning weeks beforehand, um, possibly even months beforehand. There's all kinds of strange uh, shifts. Uh, uh, livestock can act strangely, um, there's you know, tremors, there's all sorts of things. So um, a number of people had already fled. Uh, one of the ways we know that is because the number of bodies that have been excavated, even considering that area that hasn't yet been excavated, in no way equals an actual population. Um, and even considering you know, some bodies that you know, there's no way they could be reconstructed, or archaeological errors, it's still only a very small fraction of the number of people at minimum who could have lived in a Roman town. Uh, there's also um, kind of strange occurrences that only occur because people are in flux. So uh, there'll be piles of uh, possessions in one room. Uh, people will have buried all their treasure, hoping they can come back for it later. There'll be strange mixes of people, you know, rich and poor, people who wouldn't necessarily associate with each other that are all found together because they probably all took shelter in the same place at the last moment. So it's definitely um, a, a snapshot of uh, a, a moment of, of fear and chaos and flight. At the same time, uh, Pompeii is a great example of um, a city that is not Rome, but that is intertwined with the history of the larger Roman Empire. So I know I wasn't here to give the Roman Empire lecture, but in a way we can sort of see almost the shadow side of the Roman Empire through looking at the history of Pompeii. Uh, Rome itself, it, um, at its heart, is really just Rome. Like, the old, the ancient part of what is the city of Rome today, a very, very small part in this larger area of Italia. So Pompeii was not part of Rome for much of its history. And um, by looking at what happens before 79 for that eruption, uh, we, can, we can learn about the history of the area from a non-Roman perspective. So probably, um, Going back to about the 6th century BC, we can see signs of habitation, um, you know, settled, a permanent settlement. Who, 
did not mean to do that, sorry. Who those uh, early people are is sort of open to debate. At some point, the Etruscans and possibly some neighboring Greek settlers become sort of the dominant culture there. We talked about the Etruscans. This was already about a month ago now, but they were um, a powerful Italian group in Italy with their own language before the Romans. Um, and the Etruscans, in turn, were displaced by the Samnites, another Italian group um, that was quite powerful in Italy before the Romans became the dominant power. Now, the Samnites left um, probably a lot of uh, kind of permanent signs of their civilization. So they spoke an Italic language known as Oscan. And there were still sort of plaques and sometimes, you know, dedication, memorials, things like that written in Oscan at the time of the eruption in 79 that by then probably very few people could actually read. So it's kind of hard to think about it with time. We talked a little bit about this the first day, about how long the ancient world was. But Pompeii was already an ancient city with a long history uh, by the time uh, uh, the volcano erupted. And Pompeii only becomes associated with Rome during the period of Roman expansion. So this is something that I would have covered longer last, uh, last time if we'd gotten to do the Roman Empire. But between about 280 and 145 BC, the Romans were constantly in a state of war. There was actually only one year in that whole period where they were officially not actually at war. But they were always at war. Before then, they were one of you know, any number of sort of groups of farmer warriors in Italy. They were not the dominant power. We have the Etruscans, the Samnites, the Campanaeans, all sorts of other groups. But during that period, the Romans start to not just fight with their neighbors on sort of a seasonal basis, but to fight to conquer their neighbors. And Eventually, some of these other Italian groups form what's known as the Latin League, which was designed to defeat and suppress the Romans. Um, they form a giant alliance. But in 337 BC, the Romans uh, defeat the Latin League, and they begin their conquest of most of Italia, you know, the area that is you know, modern day Italy. Now, unlike some other ancient groups, like you know, the Spartans or the Athenians, um, when they conquered uh, the Latin League, they didn't, you know, slaughter, massacre, or enslave them or anything like that. They actually considered these groups as um, allies or associi and gave them what's known as um, allied rights or sometimes Latin rights, where basically they could rule themselves relatively independently, you know, keep their language, all of that, uh, basically keep up their way of life as long as they contributed um, legions to the Roman army um, and some other obligations. So every Roman legion would have an accompanied uh, allied legion, for example, that would go with them. Um, and that really was key to the Roman, stri Roman strength and their ability to keep conquering because they didn't have to always worry about suppressing, uh, you know, suppressing their neighbors. They kind of kept them, kept them fairly loyal um, by doing that. So it was um, during that period that Pompeii became one of those allies of Rome. So they were not Roman, but they were allied with Rome. And uh, during the third century, when they become an ally of Rome, uh, we start to see them really flourish. Being an ally of Rome is a you know, prosperous thing. You trade with Rome, you travel to them, um, you, know, you, can get, you can get business, all sorts of things. Um, that's when we start to see the city becoming quite wealthy. We see the first theater, we see uh, the first public bath, and we see um, a temple of Apollo that dates to that period. Now, once Rome begins conquering, conquering Italy, they then get involved in a series of foreign wars with uh, those successor states that we talked about, the Hellenistic kingdoms, Egypt, Syria, uh, 
uh, that whole area, all those areas that Alexander had conquered. They get involved with the Hellenistic kingdoms almost by chance because of um, a, a series of wars they have with the Carthaginian Empire. So we're not going to get into any of that today. But basically, Rome starts expanding outside of Italy very successfully. And once that starts to happen and the Romans begin to have you know, a true empire, lands outside of Italy, uh, by the first century BC, those original allies start to get jealous and resentful of this large empire. Because if um, you know the Syrians, all these other groups are um, becoming sort of part of Rome, then they want um, they want to be recognized as people who have been allied with Rome for hundreds hundreds of years. They want recognition that they are. Um, equal to Romans, they want to vote, they want citizenship rights, they want there to be a differentiation between people who have been allies for such a long time, who are, live right by the Romans, and then people who have just been conquered. And so the Romans don't want to do that, so that leads to something known as the social wars, which sounds very polite, and like people are drinking tea, but it comes from the word uh, socius, allies. So it's basically the wars of the allies. And they're fought from 91 to 87 BC. And those are uh, cities like Pompeii, areas um, around Rome in Italy that are fighting the Romans because they want to be Romans. Like they want Roman citizenship rights. And during those wars, um, which are incredibly bloody, the Romans realize that they are going to win, they probably can win, but in the end they're going to have to give their allies citizenship anyway, because otherwise they'll keep dealing with this same problem. So it's during these social wars that Pompeii becomes officially Roman. Now, uh, Pompeii was the scene of a lot of fighting, a great deal of bloody conflict. Uh, when excavations occur today, they will find um, lead uh, ballistas, which were, and they're sort of like cannonballs, but I mean, not with cannon fire, but they would be catapulted by the Roman army into the city. So they'll find evidence still of the fighting that went on at Pompeii during that point. Um, and sometimes they'll find, you know, scars and walls, all sorts of things. But um, at the end, the uh, Pompeii was given the rights of Roman citizenship. But it seems like they were particularly defiant because they came under the auspices of one of the great heroes of the social wars, a general named um, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Uh, he had been one of the generals who had helped defeat Pompey. And then afterwards, because of a variety of civil disagreements. He actually becomes dictator of Rome for a period of time. And he seemed to be personally invested in putting uh, Pompeii in its place, uh, kind of keeping it um, under his sort of personal submission. So for one thing, he renames it. Uh, he calls it the Colonia Cornelia Veneria Pompeiarum, which is the Cornelian colony of Pompeii under the divine protection of Venus. So the Cornelia part, that's from him. He's from the Cornelii clan. Remember, his middle name's Cornelia, so he's from the Cornelii clan. And Venus is his personal deity, like the deity that he is closest to. So he commissions a temple to Venus during this period. Um, and uh, a worship of Venus, and that includes a statue of a white heifer that's decorated with jewelry and sacrifice too. And so Pompeii is now a Roman colony with Roman citizens. That means that a lot of traditional Oscan uh, practices have to get transformed. So for example, all the, uh, all the religious positions now have to go under uh, kind of follow Roman custom. So we get um, you know, kind of the Roman uh, pontifexes. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, uh, 
uh, a pub, you know, public priest to perform uh, Roman style sacrifices. We also get a transformation of some of the temples. Uh, there's a temple of Jupiter there already, and it's transformed into a, a Roman temple celebrating the triad of uh, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. Um, in addition to all of these changes in the religious landscape, Sulla evicts a number of the leading families of Pompeii, um, and he redistributes their property to uh, Roman people, most of them probably his own veterans from the social world. So this was a typical practice for uh, Roman generals. Uh, one of the ways they got uh, the loyalty of their troops was that after a particular campaign was over, they would help settle their veterans. Uh, they would find them land. Uh, they would um, you know, distribute uh, farmland in Roman colonies, Roman conquered areas, uh, things like that. So he resettles a number of uh, Roman veterans in Pompeii. We don't know how many. It could have been, you know, up to 5,000 maybe. So a lot of people. That's going to cause a great deal of changes, particularly linguistically. So that's when Oskin starts to die away, replaced by Latin, which is why um, you know, 79 and the eruption of Vesuvius, probably very few people, if anyone, can still read Oskin anymore. And that's why we really can't read it today. Um, I mean, we can sort of like Etruscan, you know, there's some linguists that study it and can pick out, you know, some of it, but it, nobody's fluent in it. You can't get like a textbook and study it the way you can Latin. Um, and probably there was a great deal of resentment among local people. It probably also instituted some cultural changes as well. Uh, one thing that seems to have happened is the construction of an amphitheater in Pompeii this period. This is uh, the oldest amphitheater in Rome, is at Pompeii, and it dates to this period right after the social wars. And this is not a theater like for plays and song. This is an amphitheater like the Colosseum for um, gladiator games and, um, you know, sort of very violent, um, uh, violent performances. And that suggests that uh, Sulla's veterans who are former soldiers are the ones who are sort of enjoying these kinds of performances. Uh, later, uh, you know, gladiator games become, I think, just more more part of public entertainment, but in this period, as uh, they originate, they're definitely associated with the military because they're, they're very bloody and they seem to be a way for people who are maybe retired from the army to sort of keep up with that, um, that kind of life. So we have a lot of changes going on in Pompeii tied to the rise of the Roman Empire. And another moment of very significant change comes at, bless you, at the end of the Republic. So when the Republic ends, and this is uh, sort of officially in uh, 33 BC, uh, after the Battle of Actium, um, after decades and decades of civil wars uh, between um, you know, some incredibly famous uh, generals. Um, and the Battle of Actium is the famous one where Mark Anthony and Cleopatra lose. The winner is uh, C Julius Caesar's uh, adopted son and uh, maternal great uh, nephew, um, um, Gaius Octavius Thurinus, who later becomes you known sort of as Octavian, and then later he takes on the name Augustus Caesar. At the end of the Battle of Actium, he's sort of the only person left standing after decades of civil wars, and he begins the Roman imperial period, a period where instead of the Republican system that we've discussed with the two consuls, um, the popular elections, the Senate, some of that still remains like the Senate, but at the top, there is the figure of the emperor and he is the, the first one. And that begins the imperial period. And it also begins the period that's known as the Pax Romana, which is Roman peace. It's a period of extreme prosperity and stability for everyone in the Roman world. It lasts until about 192 AD with the death of the Emperor uh, Commodus. And 
during that time, um, people enjoy probably you know, the highest standard of life that anyone could in the pre-modern era, which is one of the reasons why the empire keep doing that is successful uh, because the republic had been so unstable that people are sort of willing to accept um, a new political system uh, in favor of uh, a better lifestyle. But when that happens, when Augustus uh, kind of starts becoming um, sort of the leader and uh, reorganizing the way Rome functions, we see that Pompeii gets reorganized as well. So uh, for one thing, uh, there are shrines to Augustus everywhere at all of the crossroads in Pompeii, in all of the private houses. Um, he has to be sacrificed to with wine at any public event, at any banquet. Uh, we start getting temples dedicated specifically to Augustus that arise in Pompeii. Um, and we get coins everywhere that feature him or members of his family and ideas that he wants to promote like uh, Concordia, which is of harmony and, uh, and concord. And uh, when we have that eruption in 79 BC, the emperor ruling is uh, Titus, who would, he just takes over that year from his father of his passion. They are part of those 14 emperors who ruled during the Pax Romana. So uh, that emperor Titus is ruling sort of according to the reorganized system of Augustus. Uh, some they're known as the Flavian dynasty, Titus, uh, Domitian's their father, this passion, um, and they took over from the Julio Claudian dynasty, which is the family of Augustus. So when we see Pompeii in its glor glor glorified state today, we're seeing a city that you know has all these stories, all these different layers within it. We're seeing evidence of conquest, different kinds of rule, different kinds of religions. Um, we're going to have, uh, you know, we have those early temples. We have these new temples to Augustus. Uh, we have temples to different gods. And we have temples and evidence of religious traditions from all around the Roman Empire. Uh, one of the most uh, kind of fun examples, not just today, but really it has been since the 18th century when it was excavated, is the Temple of Isis at Pompeii. So we don't think of Isis as someone who would be worshipped in a Roman temple, but uh, she definitely was. So you remember the last time we heard about Isis was during the Hellenistic period when the Ptolemies were ruling. And you remember a lot of those uh, Hellenistic queens, the different Berenikes and Arsinoes and Cleopatras, they associated themselves with Isis and also with Greek and Roman goddesses. They kind of mushed them all together. So uh, that kind of goddess was appealing all over the Middle East, the Mediterranean, not just in Egypt. And in fact, she really didn't even look particularly Egyptian anymore in some of those images we saw. The Isis at uh, Pompeii doesn't look especially Egyptian either. And she's not necessarily even uh, the Egyptian version. Uh, she becomes more uh, universal and she's not a public religious figure. So what I mean by that is that the temple of you know, Augustus is for everybody. In fact, everybody has to you know, worship Augustus. But uh, the temple of Isis at Pompeii is for initiates only. So you have to basically be part of the cult of Isis. You have to be initiated in to go into the temple and to take part in the mysteries. That's what they're called. Um, so we'll look at some, some images of, of that temple in a moment. Uh, but clearly, uh, it's, it's not you know, the traditional Egyptian Isis. It's one that's very appealing to uh, members of the Roman Empire. And the emphasis is on Isis as a figure of salvation, salvation for 
everyone in the afterlife. So uh, very appealing to people who aren't necessarily having a great time in this life. Uh, the poor, uh, women, slaves, people who are sort of not favored by uh, Roman society. Now, that temple was excavated early and in fact was um, a huge site of interest for 18th century tourists and a young Mozart saw it and that was part of his inspiration for the magic flute. So, all right. What, so then what exactly does happen in 79? What is, um, you know, what is preserved? Uh, so no one survives in Pompeii, uh, but as I said, people were aware of what was happening and they had uh, left the city in droves. Uh, some of them thought, bless you, that they'd be able to come back and they buried their valuables. Um, rather than take them with them and risk being robbed on the road. So some of the bodies that have been found are not those of people who died in the original um, eruption, but they're people who died coming back months later to try and get their property back, and then you know, a building fell on them. Bless you. Um, or you know they came back and they tried to loot and they got into a fight and it, it all went wrong. So there's a lot of a lot of things like that that happen. Um, and we're not 100% sure exactly when the eruption happened, which I find very interesting. Our way to date, we know the year, we know it's 79. Our way of dating it is from two letters from the only eyewitness that we know of. He was a historian named Pliny the Younger. His uncle was Pliny the Elder, and they were both Roman writers. And Pliny the Younger was living on the Bay of Naples. So he witnessed this, and his uncle, Pliny the Elder, actually dies in uh, the events surrounding the eruption, not because he's caught unawares, but because he's really curious. So he takes a boat and he gets too close and ends up dying. But uh, those letters. Uh, are traditionally dated to August of 79, but uh, uh, people debate that, whether they're dated correctly, because we don't have the original copies or anything like that. And it's possible that actually the eruption happened a lot later in the year. So for example, some people are found wearing winter clothing, which you wouldn't necessarily wear in August. But then again, if you're fleeing for your life, maybe you're wearing all your clothes. Who knows? Um, there's also coins that are dated um, after the eruption that are found. Some of them, of course, could have been dropped by looters, but some of them have been found in ways that archaeologists say there's no way that looters could have gotten to them. You know, they're on the victims, things like that. So we're, you know, a lot of what actually happened is, um, you know, is certainly open to debate. Now, I did give you as part of your handout. Uh, those two letters that uh, basically are our witnesses to what happened. Now, subsequent eruptions, there's uh, several in, there's one in the 17th century, in the 18th century. Of course, we have more reliable, accurate witnesses. We have more witness statements. But uh, these are the two letters from Pliny. He described it in a lot of detail. And as you read through, one of the things that you can see is that uh, all around the Bay of Naples, people were aware of what was happening. They're seeing refugees come in. They're seeing the sky darkening. Even if you were nowhere near where the lava or the ash was going to uh, was going to kill you, uh, you were still having trouble breathing, breathing in uh, the bad air, uh, there was no light, uh, the sky got really dark, so the effects of this were felt uh, very far off. Now, um, while you're looking through that, I'm going to show you some pictures. So probably the most sort of poignant and immediate images are uh, images like these. So this is a uh, from when um, some people were killed um, immediately because the heat incinerated all organic matter, leaving cavities basically in this volcanic ash that then starting as far back as the 18th century, they would make plaster casts 
using the hollows of these cavities. So that's what uh, we have here. Um, Sometimes my students uh, say that people turn into statues from the ash. I think I used to think that too, but it's actually like the, the plaster cavity. So we get these people, um, you know, in the very moments of death. Now, uh, it's interesting to think, uh, we can think about any kind of refugee crisis, any kind of natural crisis, who is left behind in the city if people know that something is going to happen? So quite Probably the group of people who are you know, caught in positions like this are not necessarily representative of the larger, the general population, but there are people who, for whatever reason, found it hard to leave. They didn't have the resources. They weren't allowed to leave. They couldn't leave for health reasons. Um, and, um, but... These are pictures from some of my trips to Pompeii. Now, these are the results of a great deal of excavation. And even, you know, having told you everything I've told you, you still do get the sense of this sort of, you know, kind of frozen ghost-like town, even knowing, you know, the history that's happened before and happened after uh, when you walk on these roads and, and see the way they were. Now, I uh, didn't know this until I went to Pompeii. Everything is so nicely laid out. You get these great maps when you go there. Um, you see all, you know, you can find your way the way you could find your way on a modern map because every street is named. That does not reflect actual Pompeii. Those were all names that archaeologists have given. We don't know what the streets were named for the most part. We don't know what the houses were named or anything like that. Um, now, that's, this is uh, the, the top of Mount Vesuvius. So, okay, this one, you can only sort of see it. There's uh, steam in the air. This is still an active volcano site, and it is being monitored constantly. There's um, you know, sort of geo, uh, geology specialists you know, at the top of the volcano monitoring this. Um, because it hasn't erupted since 1944, it could erupt any time. You know, they're pretty much due for it at this point. Um, now, the volcano was a huge presence in Pompeii before this big eruption. And there was a sense that this you know, kind of dangerous, magnificent natural force was right there. This um, is a representative on a wall fresco. And they would sometimes represent Pompeii and the spirit of Pompeii, meaning this sort of dangerous, you know, kind of volcanic, uh, you know, seismic uh, area uh, through a snake as well, um, you know, another sort of dangerous creature. And this is, um, this is Dionysus, kind of reminds me, I don't know if you remember those fruit balloon commercials, but kind of, you know, kind of looks like that. Uh, and so you can see uh, this is sort of like the spirit of the place. Okay. Um, as we get further on in time, you can see you know, some more eruptions. This was 1631. Now, no, at no point was the death toll equal to what it was in 79. This is 1944. And here, this just shows the Bay of Naples. So here's Mount Vesuvius. Here's Pompeii, uh, Herculaneum. But you can see how uh, where Pliny is writing from, he is safely away from where he's going to get incinerated uh, or anything like that. But he is he still talks about the sky growing dark. And he sees what he calls this uh, pine-like umbrella, uh, which is sort of you know, the kind of original eruption, and he talks about that in his letters. Okay, so these are some um, examples from the excavations. A lot of uh, what archaeologists try and focus on is putting aside the issue of the actual eruption, you know, what can we learn about, about daily life? So trying to excavate people's garbage is a great way to try and, you know, to learn about, for example, what they ate, what kind of, what kind of diet they had. Uh, did rich people and poor people eat the same things? You know, were there popular, you know, regional cuisines, things like that. So digging kind of deep into latrines and garbage. Um, and like any ancient city, Pompeii had a lot of garbage. Uh, you know, there's no regular waste pickup or anything like that. Um, 
we have we don't have any ancient writings that I know of from Pompeii where people are complaining about garbage. But when we get to Rome, and I can't imagine the situation is any better outside of Rome, we have ancient writers complaining about the noise, the mess, the waste, the garbage, all of that. Okay. Um, these are these are the uh, some of the baths that were there. So the Roman baths are public and they date to uh, they were reconstructed, but they date to before uh, it was a Roman colony. Um, baths in Ro the Roman world were not places to get clean. In fact, they were particularly filthy. Uh, there were ancient doctors who warned against going to the Roman baths if you're sick or you have an open wound. They say, you know, avoid them at all costs. They seem really nice because you got this water pumped in through all these amazing means, but it doesn't go back out again. It's just sort of the issue. So you get everybody's germs. The reason people would go would not really be to get clean. They were more like country clubs. They were places to kind of see and be seen. Uh, so they were sort of centers of public life. So when you go to Pompeii, I always found this very strange. All the walls seem very whitewashed. That's because tourists kept stealing things off the walls. So to stop that, they had to basically take down most of the public walls and put them in a museum in Naples. So it's the sort of disembodied view. If you really want to see everything in Pompeii, you have to go to Pompeii, and then you have to go to Naples, to the museum, to see things. Um, and one of, I think, the most fun uh, expressions of uh, ancient life that uh, Pompeii gives us access to is through graffiti on walls. So in your handout, I actually gave you a list of all the graffiti, or a sample, I should say, of some of the uh, graffiti that you can uh, you can find in Pompeii. And uh, you get the sense that uh, people haven't changed all that much when it comes to graffiti. Uh, it's the exact same stuff. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, political slogans, you know, drunken scrawls, doodles, there's all, all kinds of things. This is just one example. Um, that's kind of, I like, it's Dido Aeneas. They're characters from the Aeneid. Um, they're scribbled on a wall. There's no, um, you know, it could be like someone, you know, if someone wrote Harry Potter on, on a random wall, sort of be like that. Um, okay. All right, this is from a luxurious uh, house in Pompeii, and I've shown it to you before. Uh, this is sort of the, what is left. This is a reconstruction. It would have been on the floor. It's a huge mosaic that depicts a final battle between Alexander the Great and the Emperor Darius. And he's on, on his horse. And um, so it's, there it is projected on the floor. Now this house is, and several others are really interesting. You go into these incredibly beautiful houses decorated with frescoes and all of that. And you think these are like, you know, really rich, amazing noblemen. People who study Roman architecture say that actually a lot, some of those houses are almost like if we would go into, you know, like into Monticello or something like that. They're almost like museum houses. So if they're reconstructed the way they were in 79 AD, they don't reflect the way, you know, a millionaire, like the equivalent of like a movie star, like you know, a really rich person would actually live. They're almost more like these sort of antiquated museum-like houses because um, they reflect earlier styles. This is an image from that Temple of Isis. So see all these uh, snakes uh, representing um, Vesuvius, and then up here. So you can see those two boats on the Nile. That is the story of Isis searching for the pieces of Osiris to put back together, but it becomes sort of Romanized. This doesn't look like Egyptian art in any way, but this picture has now become, or the story has become universal enough that it's appealing to, uh, you know, to people living in this Roman town uh, or Roman city, I should say. So 
We don't know that much about the worship of Isis, mainly because it was limited to initiates. So there's not a ton of writings about how it worked. Uh, but from these pictures and you know, from the idea of the temple, we get the sense that it offered salvation um, on, a, on a wide scale. And there were several cults like that in the Roman world. Um, there's multiple layers of religious traditions going on in Pompeii. So there's you know, that official religion, there's these sort of religions that appeal to certain groups of people. And then there's more sort of private <laughs> religious practices. If you go into some of the lower rooms or um, some of the rooms in private houses, there's evidence of um, worship of um, more sort of far Eastern ecstatic cults that uh, attracted certain people. Uh, there's um, uh, the uh, goddess Sibylle um, and her lover. There's, they're sometimes called ecstatic or orgiastic cults. Um, and again, we don't know a ton about them, but they were sort of cults that people would participate in privately in groups in their homes as opposed to that public worship that would take place you know, in the forum or outside a temple. <laughs> scrolls through some of these things. All right, this is a, um, this is a, you know, one of many uh, uh, streets in Pompeii. So they have these great raised rocks. Um, they serve a lot of functions. On the one hand, there's sort of great crosswalks. That's actually how they still work today. They also helped um, during uh, storms. So Pompeii floods all the time and the water gets really high. So these streets will completely flood during uh, rainy times. So that's one of the reasons for them. Uh, probably that was a very good thing. That was probably how the streets got cleaned, um, which is, I think, one of the things we miss when we go to Pompeii now. We miss you know, the mud, uh, you know, the animal feces, the trash, just, you know, everything that probably would have been in, in one of these roads, uh, no doubt. It's, 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 it's very, very clean. This is uh, a house that still has some of its original uh, frescoes. It's known as the House of the Golden Cupids, but again, that's a, a modern name. And this Obviously, this garden has been reconstructed, but this gives you a sense of some of the wealthier uh, villas that you can go to. Okay. This is uh, the theater. These are some of my private pictures, so they're kind of wonky because it's so crowded. It's really hard to get a picture that there aren't a lot of people in. <laughs> um, this is uh, a picture of uh, the amphitheater that uh, dates to uh, the period of Sulla. Um, and it's one of the earliest ones in Rome. Uh, this, it, these are some portraits that are now in the Naples Museum um, that are, are quite compelling. I think uh, they're, they're really intriguing to look at. Uh, the style, the eyes. This is a young couple. This is a young woman. And you'll sometimes see this labeled as Sappho for no real reason. She was a, a Greek poet, um, but in the 19th century, people sort of fancied that this would have been what Sappho looked like, so you'll sometimes see that. Uh, so uh, in the Naples Museum, there is something known as the secret room, and that is where but I mean, anyone can go into it. It's just called a secret room, uh, but anyone uh, can go into it, and it has all sorts of um, you know things that in the 19th century were deemed like not necessarily fit for you know ladies. Uh, these are um, terracotta uh, breasts, um, and there's some uteri. There's some you know, different reproductive organs. Um, these got put in the secret room because people thought at the time that they were sexual. They're not actually sexual. They were. Um, they were sort of cheap things that you could buy and then offer at temples for cures for those particular ailments. So if you had, you know, growth in your breast, you would, you know, buy like this 
terracotta breasts, and then you could offer it at a temple. That's not actually unique to Pompeii. You find that all over the Roman and the, the Greek world as well. Um, on the other hand, I mean, these are pretty obvious what they are. Uh, these are also in the secret room. Uh, these are uh, little, little lamps and things like that. Um, these had been on street corners and now they're put in the museum. So for a while, people thought that the reason that there are just, you know, there's a phallus on every street corner is that Pompeii was just full of ruffles and that these were pointing the way to brothels and that there must have been, you know, 10,000 because these were, um, you know, now they're, they're on a wall, but they were actually like out in the street um, and you can find a lot of them. Contemporary scholars kind of dispute that because even if Pompeii was like, you know, the Vegas of the Roman Empire, there's no reason really to think that it was, then that's still like an outrageous amount of brothels for a regular city. Um, so more likely, and kind of in context of larger Roman history, um, this was a symbol of uh, Romanness and Roman might. Um, the Roman word for man is vir, uh, which is where our word virile comes from. So, you know, a powerful Roman man is, you know, the symbol of a powerful Rome. So these were sort of symbols of a powerful Rome, um, as opposed to pointing any which way. Now, there is one actual verifiable brothel in Pompeii, and it's kind of a tiny little sad building. Um, there's, you know, sort of vaguely lurid uh, frescoes on the wall. Um, it's really tiny. It's in a corner. It's flooded by tourists because I don't know what people think they're going to see. But it's actually kind of a, a sad little place. Um, and probably it was, you know, people by slaves. Um, and, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, not not a place where people lingered, um, though there is some interesting graffiti. Some of the graffiti has come out of that. Um, we also get some great political graffiti. Um, you know, uh, vote for Trebius, he's an honest man. Um, you know, vote for vote for so and so for public office. Um, you know, uh, here this is uh, here dwells the son of Zeus. Uh, so you know, there's just this is sort of a sense of what graffiti looks like. It seems to be in a nicer handwriting than <laughs> our graffiti, but other than that, it seems to be very similar. So this has some of the um, the graffiti that's in your handout. We get little uh, sampled poems and all of that. Um, okay, here's some more images, like some of the excavations. This is the uh, temple to Apollo. So. Um, Something that's interesting about some of the temples is that they were destroyed because of the eruption, but they weren't in great condition before that either. And in fact, uh, about um, 15 years or so before the eruption, there had been an earthquake that had damaged most of the city. And some of it was built up again. Some of it was left in ruins. So uh, the city that we've excavated is one that, you know, it's sort of, it's in the process of being reconstructed as it was. Um, and some buildings were deemed more or less important. Uh, there's a temple in the forum, bless you, to uh, Minerva and uh, Heracles that had has been left in ruins. I mean, it was ruined in the excavation, but what was ruined were ruins. Uh, so there were, you know, areas that were already sort of deemed, I guess, you know, not, you know, not of interest to the public. Right, so this is the forum. This is the center of public life with sort of the main temples. This is the theater again. All right, this is one of the sort of scroll through because I have a lot of pictures. Um, these are some of the, um, these are some mosaics. These are all reproduced in the, the Naples Museum. Um, great depictions of you know, food, things like that. Um, there's a lot of uh, fishy things there. Um, I put that in because one of the main uh, exports of Pompeii uh, before 
this eruption was garum, which was a fish sauce that the Romans valued all over the empire because it added like a kick to their food. So that was uh, you know, something Pompeii was really famous for, was um, their selling of garum. Here are the ruins of the Temple of Augustus. So this dates to uh, the that early imperial period. And here we have some more of the, um, I don't know what I just did. Somehow I went all the way. All right, we're just gonna leave it there because that's a great picture. <laughs> All right, so I could go on forever about Pompeii, but I'm curious about some of your questions. Um, and feel free to ask as well, you know, how it relates to sort of the larger story of empire as well that we didn't cover last time. Yes? I heard that it was a commercial hub that dealt in wine and they called it Falerian wine. Did you try any of the local wine when you were there? You know, that is a great question. So Pompeii itself, like the ancient city, you can't buy any refreshments. The, the modern city of Pompeii is kind of sketchy. Uh, it's not a place where you would want to hang out. And it's not just me saying that. I actually had... Um, read uh, Rick Steves' travel guides to uh, to Italy, and he said, you know, whatever you do when you go to Pompeii, don't try and stay at Pompeii, so that it's not really a very nice place. So I didn't try anything at that specific area, but I've, um, I stayed uh, nearby um, at a few different places, uh, Sorrento and Paestum, where I had all kinds of wine um, and also uh, limoncello, sort of lemon liqueur. There are roadside stands near Vesuvius that sell a wine called Lacrimi Christi. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was Valerian wine. You know, I don't think that is the same thing, but I have had Lacrimi Christi, the Tears of Christ. I've had that. I mean, you know, it's another kind of local wine, but um, I, I don't know when it dates. I don't think it's like a continuous kind of uh, tradition, but I'm sure it's similar because it's you know, local grapes. But I've had that at, at Sorrento as well. So I've had lots of wine, not specifically at, at the Hong Kong, but I've always been there with students too. So, you know, that was part of the reason. <laughs> but yes, wine and fish sauce were some of the things that they were very famous for. And those were things that the Romans really prized. Um, there's a, a series of texts known as uh, the Vindolandia tablets that are preserved copies of letters sent by soldiers stationed in um, northern Britain, Roman soldiers, and some of the things they, they complain about the cold weather, and uh, we have some commanders asking for a list of supplies, and they ask for garum, and they ask for wine, among other things, and they ask for beer. Other questions? Yes. When you say excavating, what are they excavating? Uh, volcanic ash, dirt, and how can we be in the excavation? So that's a great question. Um, they are excavating everything. So in some cases, it's volcanic ash, but for the most part, I think most, you know, a lot of that has been done except for that one area. They're excavating dirt, um, they're going under the layers of volcanic ash um, because they're trying to get below now the Roman settlement and uh, looking at sort of the history of Pompeii. So they're they're excavating that, but in some cases they're excavating uh, rubble um, against some of those buildings that had already been excavated were blown to bits in uh, the 40s, and so they're excavating rubble in some cases. Um, in a lot of areas, so not necessarily uh, Pompeii specifically, but in neighboring areas, no one was really hit by lava. So there's no there's no ash, you know, no hardened lava. But uh, the sky rained you know, pumice, ash, you know, rock, all sorts of things, and just a number of houses collapsed. So. Uh, you know, they're, they're excavating you know, all, all sorts of things. Um, and now, you know, the move is definitely to try and try and get lower, get under the ground. We've also just got better techniques at excavating. So, you know, in the 18th century, it was all about 
um, you know, first, like, well, what are the cool treasures? What are the art? What do the buildings look like? Now uh, we can, well, and I say we, I absolutely cannot do any of this, but I really admire people who can, you know, we can look at, you know, the kinds of seeds that are in waste that are being excavated out of sewer, you know, sewers and things like that to look at things like diet or um, bones, for example, are you know, getting re-examined um, because they can now look at, you know, look for evidence of disease, look for evidence of, you know, uh, genetic relationship, things like that. There's um, one group of people who were found um, in a house together and they were one of those strange groups where they don't quite fit together and so probably they all fled into this house at you know at the last minute um and you know their bones have been examined and re-examined over the years but i think in some of the more recent examinations they've been able to determine who was related to who and who was who was part of a family group and who wasn't because um some of the uh skeletons shared the same sort of genetic um kind of genetic mutation, genetic, um, uh, like illness. So they could determine sort of who, you know, the one pair was a brother, sister, things like that. So there, um, you know, I think the, the move has, you know, people are still really interested in, you know, the temples and the buildings and the art, but uh, now we can do more things with you know, dirt and bones and DNA. Yes. I have to ask about the lead pipes. Uh, we worry about lead poisoning from the water carried in lead pipes. Uh, and uh, when I first heard about it in Roman history, that was a viable theory that uh, the children of the Romans suffered from lead poisoning. But uh, now I find that that theory is not held in high esteem as it was back in 1970s. Well, I think, you know, they didn't need lead poisoning to die, um, you know, and Roman children and really any children in the ancient world were so susceptible to any number of diseases and epidemics um, that, you know, probably an epidemic would get them before, you know, anything else would. Um, and this is true, not just for the Roman world, but, you know, for any part of the ancient world or the medieval world. Um, you know, if you're most vulnerable sort of before you're one, um, then you're really vulnerable till you're three. If you can make it till about 10, you're pretty good. I mean, you know, something external, like volcanic eruption, you know, or a war could kill you, but you're less likely to succumb to, you know, a childhood illness. Uh, but, um, you know, it, I think most people dealt with either the death of a young child, either their own, a sibling, um, you know, I mean, I think that was just a very common um, for that to happen. And it, this this is not led, but it just makes me think of that. Um, and with the other gentleman's question about, you know, well, what we're excavating now. One thing that we can look at now are uh, dental, you know, uh, dental evidence. Um, and uh, something that it seems like every Roman suffered from in Pompeii, probably every Roman ever was horrible tooth decay and um you know advanced gum disease just you know, every every dental issue you could probably get um in some cases you know there's natural fluoride in the water but in a lot of cases there's not um and there doesn't seem to have been um you know great deal of mouthwash or anything like that now they did have toothbrushes um but they were actually pretty harsh and actually stripped their tooth and enamel uh so yeah dental disease seem to just, just be rampant among among other issues certainly yes to get a kind of an idea of the power of these uh, things <clears throat> if we were at the center of mount washington uh of mount st helens the trees from here to warwood would all be flying on the ground in all directions that's just amazing it, I mean, it is kind of, uh, it's very awe-inspiring when you're in 
you could be nowhere near Pompeii. You know, you could be, you know, vaguely driving around the Bay of Naples, not even be concerned with the ancient world at all. And you're still in the shadow of the mountain. Um, so, you know, just just thinking about that, I think, um, you know, is, is, is a little bit terrifying. Um, and, um, you know, if you read those, those letters uh, from, from uh, Pliny, uh, you get a sense of, um, you know, how, how scary it must have been. Um, he talks about, um, you know, the ash becoming hotter and thicker, uh, soon superseded by pumice and blackened burnt stones shattered by fire. Suddenly the sea swallowed where the shore was obstructed and choked by debris. He's not anywhere near Pompeii, I, but you know, they're still experiencing, uh, you know, this, this terror. Now, um, and of course there had been an earthquake not long before. So people were very much aware of sort of, you know, the, uh, you know, this sort of awesome, majestic terror of uh, the natural world uh, in, the, in this particular area. Um, now, I've had students and I've taught, uh, I've shown them these pictures and all that, and they say, well, why would anyone live there now? You know, wouldn't you like try and get as far away from it as possible? But the answer I think is true now, as it was for the Romans, um, because it's beautiful and amazing, and it's, you know, just this absolute sort of perfect, you know, Mediterranean getaway in the Bay of Naples. Uh, you know, there's a reason why, you know, movie stars, you know, go there now. And the rich and famous also went there. It was a great vacation spot for, for the Romans. Um, you know, there are villas all around the Bay of Naples. Um, yeah. There's wine, there's warm weather, there's sunshine, you know. So uh, the area has, has its appeal as well. Other questions? Welcome. Um, I, this is this is the end of our our ancient session. Although I feel like it's really just the beginning, <laughs> um, because there, every time I present, it sort of opens up you know new areas of discussion. So um, if you know, you shall have my email address. Anyone has any questions about anything we have covered, or you want suggestions for further reading, any documentaries, by all means, contact me. I will say, I recommended on this handout, uh, Mary Beard's uh, book about Pompeii. I definitely recommend that. She also has a great documentary about Pompeii. She's a really famous classical historian. She teaches at Cambridge. She's got, uh, she's kind of a celebrity in England. Uh, she's got, um, you know, she's got a lot of best-selling books. She's got a column, um, you know, in I think the Times, and you can find it for free on YouTube. Uh, and she has a great documentary where she walks all around. I um, mean, she actually goes into uh, some of the cesspits and explores, and she also goes through modern Naples as well uh, to kind of. And give a sense of you know a crowded bustling city you know as Pompeii would have been so I recommend that as well all right well thank you all for hosting me for uh, the last few months I've really enjoyed my time here <laughs>